Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. How often have you said the words, I will believe it when I see it? I think we've all said that quite a few times. But what is it that helps you believe someone when they tell you a story? Even if it's far-fetched or crazy, what do you rely on? Probably the source that is telling you that story. If the person you're talking to is known for making up big and grand stories because they like exaggerating and they like seeing your face of disbelief, you'll probably be a, a little bit less likely to trust them out of the gate. But sometimes you have a very trustworthy person, someone who you know speaks the truth and doesn't exaggerate and doesn't lie. They want nothing more than for you to always trust the words coming out of their mouth. It's probably a little bit more likely that you will believe them, even if it's some crazy story. As we look at this text today with doubting Thomas, that's the question we're going to ask ourselves. Who do you believe? Who do you trust? Who has shown you that everything he has said is true? And that everything he has done is for you? With an overwhelming answer, I hope, and I hope you are reminded that Jesus is more trustworthy than anyone else, including yourself, that you hear anything from. Who do you believe? When we meet up with the disciples this week, so last week we cover those women coming to the tomb, and there they find it open, and two angels tell them, He's not here. He's risen. Why do you look for the living among the dead? And they go back and tell the disciples, but the disciples think that they are speaking nonsense, that they are crazy. I mean, supposedly they saw some angels, and supposedly Jesus' body is gone, and somehow this rock was opened. But they didn't believe. They were afraid. And then we come to this upper room, which it says is the first day of the week, which for the Jews was Saturday. So the following Saturday, after Easter Sunday, there they are, locked in a room, 11 of them, without Thomas, because they're scared of the Jews. They were scared of them because they thought the leaders are going to come and think that we stole the body, and they're going to come and kill us because they are so angry. They were willing to kill Jesus. Why would they not come and kill us? Because his body is gone. They were terrified. They weren't living in trust or strength, but they were afraid. And it's behind those locked doors that Jesus appears to them. I like how twice in that text it says very clearly, the doors were locked, though Jesus stood before them. He comes in there in an extraordinary way, and he shows them his hands and his side, and he says, Peace be with you. Conveying this peace. You no longer have to be afraid. You no longer have to live in doubt because I am risen just as I promised. But then we come back to that scene again. The next evening, and Thomas is there. Thomas had a lot of reason to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead, even more than the other disciples. He had just heard 11 of his closest friends for the last three years all tell him unanimously, we have seen the Lord. So it's not just those women who ran to the tomb, or Peter and John who ran there and saw that the body was gone, but we physically all saw him together here in this room, alive, just as you and me. We saw his hands and his side standing before us. But Thomas refused to believe. Were the people telling him 
untrustworthy. Some of the questions that I'm sure were going through his head, no one can raise himself to life. That's impossible. I've seen death. Death is, death is the end. There is no coming back from that. Maybe all of these disciples are suffering from delusions, or they want to believe this out of a false hope because they can't face the fact that Jesus is actually dead and he's staying dead. But even as you listen to those reasons to doubt, do they sound more reasonable than that Jesus had actually risen from the dead? Not really. But, at least for me, every time we come to this section about Thomas and him doubting the resurrection of Jesus, I relate to him. I understand that it'd be hard to believe that your good friend had risen from the dead. Of course, all of us would love if our loved ones came back to life, but come on, let's be realistic. That's just wishful thinking that he's going to come back. And we relate with that doubt, that feeling of insecurity, and we want to see Jesus' hands and feet. Maybe if he just gives us a little glimpse of an angel or some big sign, then we will know for sure and we won't have to doubt or be afraid. God, why can't you just give us, you know, a clear sign or appear to us and just say, here I am, peace be with you, believe in me. And then, of course, God, we will believe in you, no questions asked, because the proof will be irrefutable in front of us. If you do that, Lord, we will believe 100% all the time. That's how we feel. And, thankfully, God knows us better than we know ourselves. God did that. He tried that with people. Think back in the Old Testament about the Old Testament believers and how close God was with them. How he appeared to them. He sent them angels. Think of the people that were in Egypt who prayed to God for help and he in a very visible way sent ten plagues and destroyed a nation exactly as he said he would and they painted their door frames and they felt and heard the angel of death going through Egypt, killing the firstborn, just as he said he would. And then, walking through on dry land in the Red Sea, seeing unbelievable things, and then coming to Mount Sinai and seeing this thunderous cloud covering over and hearing God speak, and they fell in fear before their God, and every day being led by a pillar of cloud, and every night a pillar of fire. And yet, how many of that nation believed in the Lord. Very few. Nearly all of them died in the desert because they did not trust, believe in God. God wants us more, wants us to have more than just knowing facts or knowledge or wisdom in our heads because he knows that that is not enough for us to believe. And if we are honest about what he has promised, what he has given in his word and in the signs and the testimony of the world around us and our own conscience, we have plenty of proof and evidence for the existence of God and the proof that he did rise to life. But we are like doubting Thomas. Not because we just want proof, but because we tend to put our hope, our belief, in someone or something else than God. This is part of our sinful nature. If you really get down to what Thomas's problem was, it wasn't about proof. If you think about all the things that he had seen, he knew 
that Jesus had the power to raise the dead. He knew by his testimony that he would die and rise. He knew from the scriptures that this was exactly what God had promised. And yet, what did he trust in? Who did he believe more than God? Himself. He felt his experiences and he saw dead bodies all over the place. And that experience told him when people die, they stay dead. That's what I know, so it's not possible that my friend could come back. And when they died, I believed and I wanted them to come back. I dreamt about it. I felt it. But that was just wishful thinking. It doesn't actually happen. What I know is that I feel guilty because I didn't stand up for Jesus more. I ran away in the garden. My sins, the sins he spoke about, is why he felt he had to go there. So it is my fault that he died, and I need to accept the fact that he is not coming back. He was trusting, he was listening to his own experience, his own sinful nature, and the world around him. Instead of the true and faithful words of God, his Savior, who promised him and told him over and over again because he knew that Thomas and the other disciples would doubt him, I have come here to die and to rise after three days. Why? Yes, because of your sin. But I will rise so that you know that your sins are forgiven. That everything that you did is gone. And yes, Thomas, I love you. Despite your doubt and your fear to believe, to hope in the resurrection of the dead and life everlasting with God. Let's think about our society a little bit. When we come to things like creation and evolution, a lot of people will claim that it's fact against belief, that science has proven, with a lot of proof, that the world really did evolve over millions or billions of years. And they will cite big-name scientists that have Discover the truths of the beginning of the world. All of that is theory. They are ideas. This is from a science where we are taking information that we can see around us, our experience, and placing that on the origins of the world way farther back than anything we can prove by sight or by science because science needs to be testable. And so, millions of people def defending that creation and evolution is a battle between fact and faith are being deceived just as fully. They are putting their faith in science and scientists versus what God says in the scriptures that in six days... He created the world with His Word. An all-powerful God, capable of creating the beautiful nature you see around us, the complexity in your own body. Even every little element of your body is so intricately and perfectly made and functions all together. And then you look on the macro scales, you look at the universe and how perfectly we are placed from the sun and how the planets are aligned. And you see proof, you see evidence of a beautiful and amazing creator who has made this world. So at the very least, we need to acknowledge that it is faith against faith. Either you believe in God, or you believe in man. Let's go to what's right and wrong in our society. What's become very popular is that our society or culture can decide what is right and wrong by popular consensus. That really, morality is in the eye of the beholder. 
And if you just look inside, then you will be able to decide what is right and wrong for you. And we make this decision not based on any proof or evidence to that. We actually have a lot of evidence to the contrary, that what God says is right and good, truly is right and good. And we see the consequences when we stray from that. And yet, people believe in that. Versus in the God who shows us a better way to live. And when we do, we see beautiful fruits in our life, and we see terrible consequences when we stray from what he says is right and wrong. So, who do you believe? Man? Yourself? Or God? When we come to death, and when we come to despair, when we come to fear, do you believe your own feelings of there's no hope? Or that hopeless feeling you get when you look at the world and you see all the terrible things happening here? Do you trust yourself to find a way out of that? Probably not. Do you believe that this world is just going to be okay if all humans can band together and create peace? Probably not. But instead, maybe you believe in fear and destruction and hopelessness, that the things happening in your life have no purpose, that these terrible things, there's no stopping them, and no one will ever get the things that they deserve. That all these things happening to us will go unavenged, and the evil will win in this world. Because that's what we see and what we experience, and that's how we feel. Do we believe that? Or do we believe God who promises and has shown His power to overcome unbelievable odds over and over and over again? See, what the Bible is, is men who have been led by God to testify to His mighty and glorious works throughout history. All of these people, disconnected by hundreds and thousands of years, have a consistent theme and focus on one God who has promised to save us from the beginning of time and has reiterated that promise and built onto it and showed us testimony throughout generation after generation that He is God and that He does the impossible. And then you have four Gospels and witnesses who went throughout the world in manuscripts the lore of the New Testament that were spread throughout the world testifying to one man that a nation, and eventually the Roman Empire, tried to kill, but could not, because it was so true, they could not stop out the fact that a man had indeed risen to life, and he didn't just do it to make a point, but he did it to give you hope. As the end of our text said, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, and that by believing in his name, you may have life. The truth is, God has given us an amazing testimony. But the greatest of all of that is that through these words, he promises to give you his Holy Spirit that teaches you to believe what these men said. So that you can put your hope in God because you feel it in your bones with your new life that God has given you that what he says is true. When he says you are a sinner and that you are guilty, you feel that. And you feel that these things are sins. And you know that God gives you peace that goes beyond this world. Peace beyond understanding. Peace that he gave to those disciples so that they had the confidence to go out, not to preach for themselves. They were all put to death except for John. But to preach so that men may have hope. So that you could have hope. So that you could put your belief in Jesus Christ and not doubt, but believe. So that you would have someone to put your hope in who will never let you down. Who always fulfilled his promises today, yesterday, and forever. The one who rules on high and will return on the last day to bring you to be with him. Because the fact is, the truth is, that death is not the end. And by believing in Jesus, in 
his name, you have new life that has begun in you here. The Holy Spirit has taught you to believe in things beyond this world, much like a child. Isn't it beautiful with kids that have much easier time believing things that they maybe have not seen? Like that a dragon could be outside ready to attack them as soon as they go outside of here. Or that the fairy godmother comes and will give them money for their tooth under their pillow. All of these things are so easy for them to grasp because they don't rely only on their experience and their fear. But they trust and believe that there are more powerful and beautiful things in God. And Jesus asks you to believe in Him too. And He is trustworthy and true. He has given you beautiful testimony, physically and spiritually, so that you can have new life in His name. So who do you believe? Believe the one who has never lied to you, who has risen to life. And he promises without condition that all who put their faith in him will be in heaven with him forever. This is where you can take your stand. Amen. Please rise.